Mobilotinib is a JAK inhibitor that has shown promise in patients with myelofibrosis. However, outcomes were actually mixed for this agent in the Simplify trials. So let's see where we are now at ASCO 2017. And to do that, I'm with Dr. Ruben Mesa, who is a professor of medicine at uh, the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center in Scottsdale. Now, based on earlier studies, what were you hoping to see with this particular agent? Well, I think the main differentiator we had seen with mamalidinib is that it could be very helpful in anemia for patients with myelofibrosis, but potentially also to help with splenomegaly and symptoms. So certainly the goal of the study was to, to try to fully define that and to see whether all things considered was it superior to ruxolitinib. Now, in this case here at ASCO, there's a pair of papers being presented. You're looking at mamalidinib versus ruxolitinib. While the second one is using a comparator arm of best available therapy, uh, yours is Jack inhibitor naive patients with myelofibrosis. Dr. Harrison is more of a second line therapy. So describe the patients first off that you were looking at and the study itself. Sure. So the Simplify One study was really a frontline study, Jack inhibitor naive. Patients were randomized to mamalidinib versus ruxolidinib with the goal of non inferiority for splenomegaly and symptom improvement. And then if it met both of those endpoints, then it could go on to, to be tested to be superior to ruxolitin for anemia. That was really the main selling point as a differentiator. The Simplify 2 that's being presented by Dr. Harrison is looking at really the second line setting. So patients receive ruxolitinib, which is currently the only approved therapy for myelofibrosis, and if they have failed, the resistant or intolerant, then they go on to mamalitinib. Now, in this case, what did you find? Well, in the Simplify 1 study, we found that the results were mixed. So one, it was not inferior for reduction in splenomegaly, and that's a, that's a key goal. Second, that it was slightly inferior to ruxolitinib for symptom control. Third, in anemia, it probably was superior. However, the study was designed that it had to meet both of the two endpoints of splenomegaly and symptoms to be really valuable for the anemia part. I don't think from my mind, it doesn't decrease the activity in terms of anemia, but in terms of the study design itself, it did fail to meet that endpoint. So the, the, the anemia part of it was a reduced transfusion requirement, correct? Correct. Now, in the, uh, the versus best available therapy, uh, essentially what they were showing is that, that was the significantly better in improving disease-related symptoms and transfusion independence. So, uh, respective, you know, they, who, that's for the people who completed the 24-week randomized treatment phase. Correct, correct. So, so, so uh, again, the anemia part it's, has been seen throughout, you know, better with the mamalitinib patients. I think just the complexity, where does it fit potentially in the algorithm compared to ruxolitinib? Now, in one case, it did uh, really affect the disease-related symptoms, and the other, it really didn't. Any reason why? Well, I think, you know, in both populations, I mean, it's clearly active. I think it's a question of how is it active compared to ruxolitinib. I think without question, compared to nothing, compared to our other standards of care, hydria and everything else, right. you know, still very active. Ruxolitinib is a very solid agent for improving disease-related symptoms. So I think some of that, uh, that complexity is borne out in that difference. You know, these agents are both JAK1 and JAK2 inhibitors. Uh, they both have some off-target effects, so that's some of the subtlety of the difference between the two molecules. So in terms of the bottom line for these two studies, what can we take away from it? Well, I think the, the, the drug is clearly active. You know, the studies did not hit their primary endpoint, so I don't think that it is, you know, data that a drug can be registered on at, at the moment. Uh, but it's active, it's helpful, Ruxolin remains the only available drug. So there are obviously ongoing discussions in terms of does it have a place, uh, and, and if so, what, what niche would that be, and what would the regulatory bodies accept as a, a reasonable path for such an agent? One thing I wanted to ask you, you used a, uh, an online e-diary for symptom reporting. How did that work out? Is that, is that pretty typical these days? Actually, it works very well. You know, it's very few questions. You know, patients are reminded until they, they fill it out being texted or emailed or things of that nature so that the compliance is very good. And it's very helpful. You know, I think as we evaluate any therapies, not only in MPNs, but whether it's in CLL or lymphoma or other things, potentially chronic therapies, you know, monitoring what that impact is on the patient, both from symptom improvement, but also in terms of low-grade toxicities, I think is very helpful.
Well, I thought it was a really good idea. So thank you very much for your time, Dr. Thank Mesa, you. and for uh, Ash Clinical News. Please look around. We have a variety of interviews, of course, online as well as in print. For uh, Ash Clinical News, I'm Rick McGuire.